Good day to all. I am Ms. Merle, and this time I shall talk about medical ethics and values. Uh, the issues in medical ethics often involve life and death. Serious health issues are raised over rights of patients, uh, informed consent, confidentiality, competence, advanced directives, negligence, and many others. Ethics uh, deals with the right uh, choices of conduct, considering all the circumstances. It deals with the distinction between what is considered right or wrong at a given time in a given culture. Medical ethics is concerned with the obligations of the doctors and other health uh, professionals in the hospital to the patient, along with other, other uh, health professionals and society. So uh, the health profession has a set of ethics uh, applicable to different groups of health professionals and healthcare institutions. Ethics is not static, applicable for all times. It is applicable for all times indeed. And what was considered good ethics 100 years ago may not be considered so today. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, so ethics, uh, some would say that it refers to the study of philosophical ideals of right and wrong behavior. It is the study of, of uh, good character, good conduct and motives, and it is concerned with uh, determining what is good or valuable to all people, take note to everyone, all people. So ethics is what guides us to tell the truth, uh, keep our promises, or help someone in need. There is a framework of ethics underlying our lives on a daily basis, helping us uh, make decisions that create positive impacts and steering us away from unjust outcomes. And uh, ethics uh, makes a society peaceful, harmonious, and a better place to live uh, by guiding the behavior of people. And ethics act as a self-governing system to keep human self-interest and the good of society at equilibrium because the, the eyes of the law are not always available. So uh, the code of ethics is... It refers to uh, the foundation of our profession. Uh, it gives guidelines for safe and compassionate care. So what is compassionate care? So how can we give compassionate care to the patients? So we have uh, one thing is the first one is we should practice a good manners. Of course, uh, health professionals always strive to be polite. But sometimes in an emergency or an otherwise a rush to a situation, this can be difficult. Anxiety can be contagious. So it is important to be calm in front of your patient. And uh, be sure to give uh, them a warm smile. Make eye contact when uh, speaking with them. And even if the clock is ticking, avoid rushed uh, body language such as uh, foot tapping or rapid fire pen clicking. And also every time um, you meet a new patient or a new member of the patient's family, introduce yourself and br briefly explain what you do or what you're doing. Open uh, communication and positive body language are fundamental to establishing trust. And second is to give compassionate care to the patients you should show personal interest. So how can we do this? Uh, making light conversation about a patient's life is another way to establish trust. Uh, you can sometimes notice little details about a person by their jewelry or other personal effects that they may have brought with them that day. Uh, does their uh, necklace contain their birthstone? Are they reading a book that looks fascinating? Or mentioning items like these can be a great conversation starter. Some patients will uh, feel more at ease when you make a little small talk as it uh, takes their mind off of the lab procedure or result for the moment. And additionally, be an interested listener. If they share a personal story, pay attention. They may, uh, they may uh, what, uh, mention family members or pets. Ask them further questions about them. Uh, your patient will have an overall more positive experience if they feel like they are treated more like a friend and less like a number in a database. And third is how can we give compassion? So to the patient, so third is uh, take uh, the time to think about what they have been through. So knowing about a person or a patient's background can help 
uh, to eliminate miscommunications. Uh, for example, unless the patient is a medical professional as well, they are not likely to understand certain medical terminology. So you will likely want to describe the lab process or procedure or testing in everyday language, language instead. And sometimes uh, patients may seem rather irritated and less uh, than friendly. So understanding what may be uh, going on in their life may explain why they are acting that way and help you to not take it personally or to respond in kind. Uh, perhaps they have been feeling sick for a while now and they're tired of feeling this way. And maybe the hospital or the lab has been backed up and they have been waiting for a long time. So that's it. Fourth, always acknowledge the feelings of your patients. Uh, it only takes a few seconds to express your empathy. It is often best to use I understand phrases rather than I know statements. Even if you have been in the patient's exact health condition, you should avoid the phrase, I know how you feel. Uh, well, that can cause some, some to feel dismissed uh, rather than empathized with. A statement more along the lines of, I understand that this is a difficult situation and I can only imagine how you must feel uh, would be better to say. <clears throat> sorry. Additionally, uh, saying I'm sorry can be appropriate at times. Uh, did something delay their labs? Uh, apologize for the wait time, even if it is not directly your fault. If they express a pain, say, I am sorry to hear that. Uh, quick expressions of empathy uh, will help increase their comfort level. And lastly, the fifth one is uh, take time to care for your own emotional needs. Healthcare providers have needs too. Of course, we're humans. And compassion, fatigue. Fatigue can be common amongst those who help others every day. The best way to avoid compassion fatigue is to give a little time to yourself. Plan a relaxing vacation or even a cozy uh, staycation because uh, proper sleep and nutrition will provide your brain with what it needs to cope with the stress. If you are busy, even just a little time out of your daily schedule for exercise can help promote stress relief and general happiness. Also cultivating a creative uh, hobby like painting or planting or singing may help get some emotions off of your chest. And uh, finally, never underestimate the power of confiding in a close friend or a trusted coworker. Sometimes receiving a sympathetic ear is just what you need to get back out there and improve lives one patient at a time. So please uh, note that the purpose of a uh, code of ethics is to inform those acting on behalf of the organization how they should conduct themselves. A code of ethics reiterates the organization's uh, values and morals so that the employees and third parties understand the standards they are accountable to uphold. So again, Code of Ethics, it defines uh, the uh, practice, defines the practice of others, the public. It is a definition of professional standards. Next is uh, we will be having the ASCLS Code of Ethics. <coughs> Sorry. So the Code of Ethics of the American Society of Clinical Laboratory Science sets forth the principles and standards by which clinical laboratory professionals practice their profession. So it includes three duties. It has three duties, namely we have in the form of duty to the patient, duty to the colleagues in the profession, and duty to the uh, society. So uh, let's start with a duty to the patient. So clinical lab professionals are accountable for the quality and integrity of the laboratory services they provide. This obligation includes maintaining individual competence in judgment and performance and striving to safeguard the patient from incompetent or illegal practice by others. Also, clinical lab professionals must maintain high standards of practice. They exercise sound uh, judgment in establishing, performing, and evaluating laboratory testing. And third is, uh, clinical laboratory uh, professionals maintain strict, take note, strict confidentiality of patient information and test results. Strict confidentiality of patient info because they should safeguard the dignity and privacy of patients and provide accurate information to other healthcare professionals about the services they provide. Second duty is 
for the colleagues and the profession. So clinical law professionals uphold and maintain the dignity and respect of our profession and strive to maintain our reputation of honesty, integrity, and reliability of the profession. And uh, clinical lab professionals contribute to the advancement of the profession. How? Uh, by improving the body of knowledge, adapting scientific advances that benefit the patient, maintaining high standards of practice and education, and seeking fair socioeconomic working conditions for members of the profession. Also, clinical laboratory professionals actively strive to establish co cooperative and respectful working relationships with other healthcare professionals with a primary objective of ensuring a high standard of care for the patients they serve. The last duty is a duty to the society. As a practitioners of an autonomous uh, profession, clinical lab professionals have the responsibility to contribute to the general well-being of the community. Clinical lab professionals comply, must comply with the relevant laws and regulations pertaining to the practice of clinical laboratory science and actively seek within the dictates of their consciences to change those which do not meet the high standards of care and practice to which the profession is committed. So uh, the pledge to the profession, so this one, I will be uh, reading it one by one. As a clinical laboratory professional, I strive to first uh, maintain and promote standards of excellence in promoting and advancing the art and science of my profession, preserve the dignity and privacy of others, more especially to the patients, uphold and maintain the dignity and respect of our profession, seek to establish cooperative and respectful working relationships with other health professionals. So there is a collaboration with other health professionals and contribute to the general well-being of the community. Well, you can do this by uh, doing medical missions and the likes or doing research, of course. And I will actively demonstrate my commitment to these responsibilities throughout my professional life. It doesn't end, so it has to be all throughout. And then uh, let's go to the topic about bioethics. So it refers specifically to uh, ethical issues that affect health in the delivery of healthcare. So, uh, well, bioethics uh, is a guide or it helps in guiding complicated negotiations that characterize contemporary decisions about healthcare. So what is bioeth bioethics? It concerns itself with addressing ethical issues in healthcare, medicine, research, biotechnology, and the environment. Typically, these issues are addressed from many different disciplines. People contribute to bioethics discussion, drawing on expertise and methods from the sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. So what are the key ethical concerns in bioethics that often involve big questions such as like, what should I do and how should I act? How should I treat others? What are my obligations or responsibilities towards others? What type of person should I be? What does it mean to be a good medical technologist, a doctor or a nurse? And some issues about which bioethics concerns itself. So like examples are physician, the physician patient relationship, death and dying, resource allocation, like for example, giving a vaccinations in less privileged areas or provinces in the Philippines, assisted reproductive techn techniques and their use, those wanting to have in vitro uh, technology to conceive, uh, genetic testing and screening, sexuality, sexuality, sorry, and gender, environmental ethics, clinical research ethics, disability issues, consent, vulnerability, and or coercion, mental health illness, treatments and care for patients, ethical treatment of research subjects in clinical trials, and ethical treatment of animals. So uh, medical ethics, they were first developed by Tom B. Trump and James Childress. In medical ethics is based on a series of ethical principles that are particularly relevant to the medical practice and patient care. So what is healthcare ethics? Healthcare ethics is also known as medical ethics or bioethics. At its simplest, it is a set of moral principles, beliefs, and values that guide us in making choices about medical care. At the core of uh, healthcare ethics, 
ethics or sense of right and wrong and our beliefs about rights we possess and duties we owe to others. Thinking carefully about the ethics aspects of healthcare decisions help us make choices that are right, good, fair, and just. So the core principles of healthcare ethics talks about, uh, well, our uh, ethical responsibilities in a given situation depend in part on the nature of the decision and in part of the roles we play. Uh, for example, a patient and his or her family play different roles and owe different ethical obligations to each other than a patient and his or her physician. And uh, guys, uh, please remember that there are four main principles that define the ethical duties that healthcare professionals owe to patients. And they are, we have autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. All four principles are considered to be in effect at all times. In theory, each is of equal weight or importance. However, in some countries like the U.S., respect for patient autonomy often takes priority over the others. And then uh, we have medical ethics. So uh, this one, we have it offers a way to approach ethical dilemmas. So it's a guide. Um, it aids in making difficult healthcare decisions. So, uh, but before uh, going to the second part, uh, what are ethical dilemmas? So an ethical dilemma describes a conflict between two morally correct courses of action. Uh, there is a conflict between values or principles. The dilemma is that you would be doing something right and wrong at the same time. And by taking one right course, you will negate the other right course. Ethical issues happen when choices need to be made. Uh, the answers may not be clear and the options are not ideal. The result could be declines in the quality of patient care, problematic clinical relationships, and moral distress, which is defined as knowing the right thing to do but not being allowed or able to do it. Uh, so what are examples of ethical dilemmas? We have balancing care, quality, and efficiency. We have improving access to care, addressing end-of-life issues, and allocating limited medications and donor organs. So that's it. And medical ethics is important because it provides a way to organize or thinking about ethical issues in patient care and calls attention to aspects of medical situation that might be overlooked especially for those who are vulnerable, the vulnerable population that includes the insane, those mentally incapacitated, uh, the, the kids, of course, and uh, the infants, the likes. So the four basic principles of medical ethics include, again, we have a beneficence, non-maleficence, respect for autonomy and justice. So let's start with the principle of beneficence. So uh, medical practitioners, uh, should remember that they should act in the best best interests of the patient. How can they do this? By preventing harm, removing harm, and promoting good for the patient. So it's more on taking positive actions to help others and actively seeking benefits. So with beneficence, we are promoting good and doing good to others because the term beneficence connotes acts of personal qualities of mercy, kindness, generosity, and charity. Beneficence uh, from the Latin word beneficentia means kindness and generosity. And this principle refers to the moral obligation to act in a manner that will benefit others. However, in trying to exert a positive effect, a risk of harm may exist. And therefore, the principle of non-maleficence must be taken into consideration as a net benefit over harm. Thus, these principles consider the balance of risks versus benefits, benefits over burdens. And uh, medi many medical uh, treatments involve some form of harm, even if minimal. But the harm should not uh, be disproportionate to the benefits of the treatment. Though most clinical uh, scenarios involve a clear-cut preponderance of beneficence over maleficence or the opposite, allowing clinicians to easily decide on a plan of treatment, there are situations where these uh, two principles are roughly equally potent, making it a potentially very difficult to make a clinically and ethically sound recommendation. Next, we have the principle of non-maleficence. So uh, the thing we should remember here is that uh, medical practitioners must not harm the patient. 
because the word maleficence means to harm or to hurt. Thus, non-maleficence is the avoidance, the avoidance of harming or hurting the patient. So it's a uh, primum non no share. So first, do no harm. This one. And here, we as uh, you in the near future will become, you should try to do the least possible harm to your patients and refrain from doing what damages the patient's interests. And please actively seek to do no harm. So again, what is non-maleficence? It is the sister to beneficence and is often considered as an inseparable pillar of ethics. Non-maleficence uh, states that a medical practitioner has a duty to do, again, to do no harm or allow harm to be caused to a patient through neglect. Any consideration of beneficence is likely, therefore, to involve an examination of non-maleficence. And you might ask me, how is non-maleficence different from beneficence? Well, uh, non-maleficence differs from beneficence in two major ways. First of all, it acts as a threshold for treatment. If a treatment causes more harm than good, then it should not be considered. This is in contrast to beneficence where we uh, consider all valid treatment options and then rank them in order of preference. Again, ranking in order of preference, this beneficence, and for uh, non-maleficence, it's more on like the treatment causes more harm than good and it should not be considered, okay? So it's where like, uh, like considering all valid treatment options for beneficence, sorry. And then second, we tend to use beneficence in response to a specific situation, such as determining the best treatment for a patient. In contrast, non-maleficence is a constant in clinical practice. For example, if you see a patient collapse in a corridor, you have a duty to provide or seek medical attention to prevent injury. Next is the principle of respect for autonomy. So here, we are talking about capable patients. So capable patients must be allowed or permitted to accept or refuse recommended medical interventions. Autonomy is uh, synonymous to self-determination or the capacity to make one's own decisions. And this capacity involves the ability to make and communicate healthcare decisions. And the words that are synonymous with autonomy are independence, self-determination and self-reliance. Well, respect for autonomy is a norm that obliges us to respect the decisions of adults who have decision-making capacity, those who are capable patients. And three conditions must exist for autonomous action by those with capacity to choose. One is intentionality, second is understanding, and third is absence of controlling influences that determine their actions. So there is no undue coercion or force. And the following moral rules or applications are derived from the application of the principle of respect for autonomy. So first is tell the truth, respect the privacy of others, protect of confidential information and obtain consent for interventions with patients. Next is the principle, again, the principle of respect for autonomy. So respect for patient autonomy requires that those with this capacity be permitted to accept or to refuse treatment alternatives recommended by their, their sorry, physicians. So what's the primary requirement for this is the voluntary informed consent. So what is that voluntary informed consent? consent. So informed consent is the voluntary agreement of a subject or a patient to participate in any medical procedure. It's more than a signed form. It represents the ethical responsibility of the health professional to ensure that participants or patients have an understanding of the procedure being conducted or about to be conducted to them and their inherent benefits and risks. So who are capable patients? Capable patients are those who have medical decision making capacity and they if and if they can demonstrate understanding of the situation appreciation of the consequences of their decision and reasoning in their thought process and if they can communicate with wishes so capable patients must be provided with full relevant and truthful information about recommended treatments and any reasonable alternatives including expected benefits 
potential risks and the results of refusing treatment altogether. And uh, always remember that a voluntary decision must be made by the patient without undue influence in the absence of undue influence or coercion. And then what, what do you mean by without coercion? It means the patient is not forced to take a medical decision. And then uh, well, how about who are, who are those uh, population who are considered to be incapable of making uh, capable decisions? Those are the vulnerable populations that includes minors, kids, babies, those in coma, the insane, and those in emergency situ situations. And then uh, next is the principle of distributive justice. So healthcare resources should be distributed in a fair way among the society. So there must be fairness and equity and a fair distribution of resources and rank recipients according to need. And this one, this principle is applicable when resources are expensive or expensive or scarce and decisions must be made about who will receive these resources. Uh, well, the notion for fair distribution is that uh, distributive justice is concerned with a fair, fair allocation of resources among diverse members of a community. Fair allocation typically takes into account the total amount of goods to be distributed, uh, the distributing procedure, and the pattern of distribution that results. So uh, according to Armstrong, uh, Armstrong distinguishes between distributive justice generally and the principles of distributive justice. He defined distributive justice as the ways that the benefits and the burdens of our lives are shared between members of our society or our community. Principles of distributive justice tells us how these benefits and burdens ought to be shared or distributed. Because societies have a limited amount of wealth and resources, the question of uh, how those benefits ought to be distributed frequently arises. The common answer is that public assets should be distributed in a reasonable manner so that each individual receives a fair share. But this leaves open the question of what contributes a fair share. Uh, various principles might determine of how goods are distributed. So let's have equality, equity, and need are among the most common criteria. So we have, again, equality, equity, and the need. So healthcare resources should be distributed in a fair way among the members of the society. And this uh, principle is applicable when resources, again, are scarce or expensive. Also remember that. And now we are on the ball that brings forth the principle of respect for dignity. So patients, their families, and surrogate decision makers, as well as healthcare providers, all have the right to dignity. And the respect for dignity is meant to apply to everyone involved in the medical encounter. It is based on the fundamental idea that all persons should be treated with respect and dignity. Take note, all persons should be treated with respect and dignity. Respect for persons and respect for their dignity applies whether or not healthcare decisions are being made and even to those who are not capable of making their own decisions. Remember those who belong to the vulnerable populations. Among uh, the most important human needs is the desire for respect and dignity. And that need doesn't change when a person becomes ill or disabled. Indeed, it may grow even, grow even stronger. So there are many things that you can do to make sure that a person in your care receives the respect and dignity that every person's basic human right, that is every person's uh, basic human right. So uh, respect his privacy physically and emotionally. And... Uh, for you to uh, apply the principle of respect for dignity, uh, you like simple manners like closing the door when you help him dress or use the bathroom, uh, knock before opening a closed door, uh, don't discuss confidential information with other people, even family members without his permission, and uh, respect his right to make choices. By making choices, we have a sense of control over our life and let him decide what what and when to eat, for example, if he is able. 
if he has cognitive problems of our choices of what to eat, what, when to eat, or what to wear, or uh, which arm that uh, the patient would want for his uh, venipuncture, but and explain if the vein is not okay on that side. And then uh, if, for example, uh, on, 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 on and another thing, if he insists on wearing the same a shirt every day, use a protective towel when he eats and wash clothes in the evening, things like that. Like you are really uh, giving him a choice in doing things. If a choice seems silly or unimportant to you, try to see why it may be important to him. If he refuses to take medication or a lab procedure or doesn't want to uh, participate in a laboratory test, or make other choices that would be dangerous, try to negotiate possible solutions. Offer pills with a fav favorite snack, for example, if you're a nurse, and agree to give baths only as often as absolutely necessary. Arrange for someone to take walks with him if he or, is he or she is unsafe by himself, like those who are having mental illnesses, and treat the patient with dignity. How? By listening to his concerns, and ask for his opinions and let him know they're important to you. Involve him in as many decisions as possible. Include him in the conversation. Don't talk about him as though he's not there and speak to him as an adult, even if you're not sure how much he understands. So that's the way how you can uh, uphold the principle of respect for dignity. Again, now, this uh, respect, uh, this principle should not change if the person becomes ill, if the person doesn't have uh, the hands, if the person is uh, mentally incapacitated, if the person is a kid, if the person is in a comatose stage. So always uh, try to apply the respect for dignity to your patients in all uh, dealings with them in the lab. And then... Uh, so what does this principle include? So respect for people's dignity will uh, encompass or is encompassing the following uh, aspects, like the emotional aspect of the patient, the relationships, reasonable goals of the patient, privacy and bodily integrity. And respecting these uh, personal characteristics requires that they be acknowledged and be taken into consideration in all medical encounters and in all aspects of patient care. Again, in all medical encounters and in all aspects of patient care. So the, uh, this principle also needs or requires confidentiality for patients' medical conditions and the treatments they are receiving. So this is applicable, especially for those patients receiving treatments, for example, uh, HIV AIDS. Next, we have the principle of veracity. So the capable patient must be provided with a complete take note, complete truth about his or her medical condition. And this is the only way that a patient can make a truly informed decision about accepting or rejecting recommended medical interventions. So truth telling, the principle of veracity requires that healthcare providers be honest in their interactions with patients Traditional ethics holds that it is simply wrong morally to lie to people, even if it is expedient to do so, even if a better outcome will come from the lie. According to this view, lying to people is morally wrong in that it shows lack of respect for them. <clears throat> well, being honest with patients helps to build and maintain trusting relationships that are essential to the delivery of quality patient care. However, as with other principles, telling the truth to a patient is not always viewed as the right thing to do. The principle of truth telling is influenced, interpreted, and valued differently because of the backgrounds, education, and socioeconomic status of providers, rather healthcare professionals, and the patients. <coughs> Next is we have a fidelity. Uh, this refers to the agreement to keep promises, keeping promises. Fidelity is rooted in respect for persons and truth-telling. Faithfulness to promises is important in relationships. Why? Because it indicates the level of esteem held for one another and it establishes the trust. When a person makes a promise, he or she creates expectations of another. The person expects to rely on the promise and have a valid claim that it will be kept. Generally, 
promises to peers are not explicit, but are shown through actions that are implicit promises are being kept regarding important aspects of working together, such as honesty, not taking advantage of each other and demonstrating dependability to be there for help and assistance when needed. And uh, close to the last slide is uh, accountability. It refers to the ability to answer for one's own actions. It is best ensured and measured when quality of care has been defined. So the definition of accountability is taking or being assigned responsibility for something that you have done or something you are supposed to do. An example of uh, accountability is when an employee admits an error she made on a laboratory uh, testing or procedure or in a project. And uh, next, this is the last responsibility it refers to the uh, to the characteristics of reliability and dependability it implies an ability to distinguish between right and wrong and it includes a duty to perform actions well and thoughtfully so meaning so in philosophy a moral responsibility is the status of morally deserving praise blame reward or punishment for an act or omission in accordance with one's moral obligations. Deciding what counts as morally obligatory is a principal concern of ethics. This is the end of the slide, and I hope you have learned something for this with this topic. <laughs>